Hi everyone, thank you for waiting and we will begin our webinar now. So, um, sorry for the technical difficulties, first of all, and I will introduce our speaker. So, our speaker is our speaker this afternoon finished his graduate studies in economics at the University of Manchester as well as in what is now known as the University of Asia and the Pacific. His previous work before becoming the resident economist at Philippine National Bank, he was senior economist at Citibank covering macroanalytics for the Philippines and Thailand. He is regularly cited as one of the top income strategists in local asset markets by the Fund Managers Association of the Philippines and in regional surveys, such as the Asset and Asia Money. Please allow me now to welcome Mr. June Trinidad. Sir June, you have the floor. Thank you, Adi, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for spending time for, um, for me to share with you my two cents worth on what's happening right now. Am I coming in loud and clear? Yes, sir. Yes? Okay. Well, um, what I'll do now is that uh, I, I know that uh, you prefer to uh, shoot your questions now and uh, rather than uh, go through each set of slides that I have here before you. Um, what I'll do is uh, uh, highlight some key takeaways and hopefully some of these slides that I have here uh, would not just be picturesque but more than enough to support some of the ideas that I'd like to flag before the group right now. In, my, in this first slide, I'm sure you've seen some of this, the PMI composite output indices from US to even here in, in, in the Philippines. But uh, like one uh, client was asking me, so, so what does this all mean for me? I know it's bad news. Yeah, look at all those green lines, composite index of survey, of services and manufacturing all down. Uh, close to uh, the 20, 30 percent never seen before, and for some, even exceeding what transpired during the 2009 crisis. And this composite index is already a blend of services and manufacturing. And based on this indicator, uh, anything below 50 is bad, uh, really a crash as you go closer to zero, and anything above 50 is expansionary. So it's the same picture for most PMI in the indices. Uh, and the big question, and coupled with the uh, labor uh, market indicators that we've seen lately for the U.S. and in other countries, uh, anecdotal evidence, surveys uh, pointing to declines, particularly for MSMEs, uh, um, having difficulty with their businesses, uh, GDP numbers in the first quarter reported by different countries, including ours, uh, <clears throat> all flagging, showing... Uh, uh, how bad the situation is, some in borderline growth, others uh, fractional declines to hefty drops. Oh, what does this all mean as far as we're concerned? I know they're all bad news, right? But for me, uh, what it means is that uh, when you see most of these indicators showing, you know, uh, alarming <laughs> estimates, it tells me that uh, the economy, the global economy is now not just in a recession, which is a duh, everyone knows that that's likely to happen, but we're hitting or getting close to the cyclical bottom. And that for me is uh, not just a relief, but it also tells me that uh, maybe this is the time now to start uh, rethinking my business plans, reformulating them, uh, if you haven't done so already, maybe even rethinking the long-term business model. Because uh, once we hit that cyclical bottom, and I know that the big question would be on what the outlook for the recovery would be. But before we go into recovery talk, huh, maybe we can focus a little bit on uh, what it means for an economy, including our own, to uh, settle to where the lows are well, Basically, if you want some layman's terms, I was explaining to a client not too long ago, it just tells you that this is the minimum spending, whether it's on the consumer or business side, that this economy, subject to the pandemic crisis, will go through. The minimum. And uh, anything beyond that would probably reflect mass starvation or, uh, 
you know, uh, people starting to eat their young. Hopefully, it won't happen that way. But uh, clearly, there's a minimum. What in 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 the calculus we've learned is there's an asymptotic limit to the in the uh, to how low the economy is going to grow, and it varies per economy. And if you look at uh, this slide, look at uh, the projections of the IMF. Um, you can see there that this asymmetry, as far as how bad the global recession is, they've actually, uh, you know, uh, disaggregated it into uh, across most of the key regions that we're, that you guys are normally doing business with. And as far as our backyard is concerned, for emerging Asia, we seem to be a lot less, you know, vulnerable. Uh, nonetheless, going still through a recession, but perhaps not as bad, right? So basically, uh, whether we see the IMF forecast come through to form the point, there is a for this quarter, fourth, first quarter already over and done with. For this quarter, we are nearing that six bottom and again estimates will vary I have my own which I'll gladly share with you later and the point there is that the minimum spending that households and businesses would undertake such that it would be uh, a good opportunity for all of us to start thinking about what lies ahead particularly as far as the recovery is concerned now while we're still here while we're still here, we haven't hit bottom yet, but getting there, huh? getting there. Um, <clears throat> big question is what, uh, and I'm sure uh, this has been brought up and raised uh, a number of times, especially by my broker friends. Is this a good time, if I had money, good time to buy oversold assets? Where they're from real estate, uh, businesses that are, not doing so well, and uh, more than willing to sell now to oversold financial assets. Well, the sense I'm getting is that uh, <clears throat> clearly there will be those who have the money and the gumption to start picking their spots, right? But take note that uh, when data, hard data, confirms just how bad the situation is and provides us with a sense of what that bottom is, markets will still get spooked. I find it funny, amusing, talk, hearing uh, some of these talking heads and guests in business shows saying that everything is priced in, priced in, priced in. But when the number comes out, futures and you know, um, uh, markets still react relatively negatively. That, of course, are not as bad as what many would be expecting. But uh, because of the, all the central bank puts and the <laughs> stimulus packages that were you know, uh, deployed, uh, as COVID-19 broke out across different regions, rest of the world outside China, that probably helped. But markets would still react in a very negative way. So sense I'm getting is that uh, maybe it's not time to be so confident in buying all of these oversold assets. And time still to pick and choose, determine uh, which still has very good value at this juncture. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, decide uh, moving forward. Not to mention that uh, when data, hard data, huh? not forecast, hard data will be confirming how bad the situation is, we may start to revisit the bottoms that we've seen for the financial markets. Uh, you, you cannot deny that. And that uh, if that's a, a scenario which we cannot ignore, clearly the trading strategy there would be to sell on rallies. So given all this risk, I would, I'm advising uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, clients, and uh, friends, and those who care to listen, that uh, cyclical bottom is not a strong guarantee that the financial markets would start to recover or that uh, it's time to be buying uh, uh, everything that you see listed on the board, right? Um, <clears throat> the big question now is, uh, and I have a lot of slides here, how... You know, what's the outlook as far as we're concerned? And how low would that cyclical bottom be? Uh, in this slide, I'm hoping that uh, it's very clear to you guys. Um, um, these are my recent uh, updates. Again, I'm not as bearish as some uh, economists, um, including the government, 
Um, and I'll tell you why. But nonetheless, whether you believe this set of numbers or you believe someone else, huh, what I'm telling, again, my colleagues in the bank um, and then uh, those who care to listen would be to structure, to put a structure to one's bearish sentiment or even sober sentiment. For you to tell me, to tell the rest of the world where the choke points are and not just pick a number because this is what my business, this is what I feel, this is what uh, I've heard a lot, so I'm just taking averages here and there. If you look at the 1Q GDP that came out for us, minus zero spot 2% year on year, that's my forecast, 0.5% year on year. And um, <clears throat> consensus was at positive 2.9% year on year. Now, what I missed, uh, what I miss, where the slippage came from is just one account. And perhaps this is what will govern much of the discussions and Q&A later on. Household final consumption, look at that. It barely grew. Peaked out 0.2% year-on-year growth. And my forecast was at 32 because I was reserving, so to speak, the worst case for the second quarter. But what this tells me is indeed you know, the, the, the pandemic crisis and all the <clears throat> bottlenecks and problems uh, they have caused from supply shocks to morphing into uh, demand issues because of, uh, you know, temporary layoffs that may soon become permanent is now an eroding the consumption fiber, so to speak. So, so what's wrong? You might say government is still spending and, you know, investments may be delayed, etc. cetera. But well, why just focus on that? Because... Based on the latest GDP updated uh, time series using 2018 set of prices, household consumption in this country accounts for more than 70, 70 uh, percent of GDP. And if you add government spending and the private capex and construction, excluding inventory, that sums up the domestic demand with a ratio of 111% or 110% of GDP. So we are really an insular, uh, market-oriented type of economy. And if you see that this single account consumption, not investments, not capex, not construction, is key and contributes a lot to how quickly GDP can rise or fall, then clearly that's one choke point that everyone should be very wary of and that should govern how bearish or how sober um, your expectations would be in this pandemic as far as we're concerned, right? Now, the thing that uh, <clears throat> I'd like to highlight as far as consumption is concerned and why it has, um, you know, um, uh, east to a... Uh, uh, such a puny number uh, is that uh, remember the historical norm for our consumption rate here is anywhere from uh, uh, six to even a high of seven percent in the not too recent past prior to COVID. Huh? So you can see the deflation is really material. Now, if you break down, go beyond the headline numbers of consumption, and you can and keeping our discussions on a binary um, basis, there's just two. You can classify them into two, all the components of household consumption into basic and discretionary. Basic and discretionary. And the basic here would refer to food, uh, non-alcoholic beverage, um, rent, uh, you know, electricity, uh, paying water and, uh, you know, cooking fuel used in the residences, and a little bit of transport money, right? Yeah? Like I step out of my house to go to the, gro the grocery is not to, uh, it's not just a stone's throw. So, you know, I have to use uh, whatever means of uh, possible, commu uh, you know, transportation just to be able to do some panic buying, right? So um, <clears throat> that, in my view, would provide us with a little bit of rationality as to how sober or how bearish we can end my forecast below red line uh, red numbers second quarter down to the fourth quarter full year tells you or suggests 
um, that uh, much of the um, spending destruction, so to speak, or foregone expenditures because of the COVID and changing pri consumer priorities would be focused on discretionary demand from clothing and footwear, going to the malls, your fine dining to favorite restaurants. And you can do that because they're closed and you're, the area you're living in may be in strict quarantine. You don't know. To uh, recreation, uh, going to the movies now, it's only concentrated on Netflix or that novellas that uh, you might have saved. Um, <clears throat> and uh, household furnishings can wait for some other time as long as your smartphone and your uh, uh, laptops and computers are working, um, including the Wi-Fi, <laughs> needless to say. So it's very limit. it's a, a, a significant uh, size of uh, spending that's going to be foregone. And I was an anecdotal experience, uh, talking with, exchanging ideas with friends. Some of them are saying that uh, maybe I'm saving more money now that can easily make up and spend for my basic budgets, right? Food, uh, raw food stuffs that you order online or going to the groceries where if it's available, canned goods, et cetera, paying uh, Eralco, uh, um, water bills, more than enough because now you're not spending as much on gas, on maintenance, or even providing allowances to your kids. Huh? Uh, as well as, uh, you know, going out on expensive family dinners, get together with friends, all that's gone, at least under, while we're under ECQ. And uh, some may be, be able to uh, save the money, assuming the jobs are still there, um, and use it for basic consumption, which is why I'm sensing, why would consumption be very negative? as some are saying in their forecast. If basic consumption, which is 60%, 60 percent huh, of total consumption is, is uh, still thriving, alive and well, particularly if you have a middle class, a growing middle class uh, with jobs still available and adequate savings, at least in the near term, to be able to support basic spending. So you may agree, may not agree with the numbers I have here, but point is that if ever you're going to be extremely bearish as far as our situation is concerned of where the cyclical bottom is, you have to decide and make it very clear in your mind as to where the source of negativism is going to come from. And in my view, in my view, given the numbers, it's really going to be from four gun discretionary spending. Does it mean that uh, everyone will be buying lechon, right? Or uh, wagyu and uh, that's going to keep up uh, basic expenditures? No, sir, no, ma'am. But seeing growth of anywhere from one to 2% for basic consumption, um, uh, including recovery is still a potential, although um, the way I see it, uh, that will also depend to a large extent on how efficient and how effective uh, the stimulus program of the government will be in targeting the vulnerable 18 million households um, uh, because they also comprise a large chunk of uh, the economy and especially uh, contributing a lot to uh, basic consumption as well. Now for investments, you know, exports, I guess your guess is as good as mine. Clearly, uh, even the first quarter numbers, as I'll show later, have already indicated that uh, key components on the investments, exports, uh, inventory, uh, changes are already down. Hopefully not out, right? But uh, clearly as we hit cyclical bottom, you'll probably see more uh, deeper uh, declines, larger declines as far as some of these non-consumption elements are concerned. Now, one key point before we leave this slide is that um, <clears throat> when you see spending, whether of the consumption kind or the non-consumption kind, fall 
has uh, already been flagged in this set of numbers, actual or even forecast, it should also get reflected in import compression. Yeah? Now, why is that so? Because an economy that's 2.3 times larger than what it was 11, 10 years ago, uh, when we had a 209 financial crisis, also means that they're just diversified. We had more BPO revenues now, OFW, some more investments that were made compared to 11 years ago. It also tells you that the scope for import reduction is very significant. If we're going to see a massive pullback as far as demand is concerned. Because the key driver of domestic demand of a, a commodity import as far as we're concerned, it's not just low oil prices. And I'll show you the slide later on, which I, maybe I should go to that right now. Here, here, there you go. If you look at this bottom table, all colored uh, yellow, maka yellow as uh, President Duterte would say it, uh, you're seeing imports decline by two digits. And that's just for the month of March, when we had that ECQ as well as a supply shock. And if you go across the different the spectrum of uh, segments, you can see that, uh, well, imports of crude and fuel, bottom row, 32% uh, drop, but its weighted impact, as far as its contribution to headline import growth, is only close to four percentage points much smaller than what the contribution of capital goods and raw materials. Why, you might ask? Simple, because the share of imports of oil, fuel, coal, and the refined petroleum products are not as much as the imports of capital goods uh, from telecoms to uh, cement mixers to big haulers to uh, aircraft, ships, and boats, computers, you name it, as well as raw materials. The share is, uh, of uh, oil is about, uh, and fuel, the combined, the collective uh, percentage is about 11 to 12 percent, if I recall right. So the non-oil imports, including consumer goods, certainly much more. And therefore, if domestic demand is not just for oil, but includes all this, including consumer goods, with discretionary demand contributing to imports of consumer goods that's likely to collapse. I think that there's going to be very significant import compression, which is what we're seeing in the first quarter, GDP, and um, <clears throat> um, in our forecast. And uh, as far as my second quarter forecasts are concerned, uh, GDP numbers minus three and a half, slight recovery in the third quarter, fourth quarter 4% to yield a 2020 growth of 0%. As I've said, if you're going to ask me how confident am I in these numbers, I'll probably say to you, like what I've said to a couple of bank clients, your guess is still as good as mine. Yeah? But... Let's put a structure to how bearish we are going to be because we don't want to uh, overshoot uh, the negative uh, sentiment and try to be as sober as we can. Now, next slide tells you the difference between household consumption, sorry, uh, breaking down household consumption to basic and discretionary and per capita basis. The basic consumption, which is still a large chunk of uh, household consumption, uh, appears to be, you know, supported by OFW remittances, although the left-hand panel chart doesn't show a very close correlation as far as uh, the set of numbers, the, the, the line graphs are concerned. But if you look at per capita discretionary consumption, light blue line, uh, versus the red line, which is per capita GDP. Uh, the numbers are scaled in the left-hand uh, vertical axis. 
it tells you that there seems to be a close correlation between the two. And why? Because as incomes rise, a lot more of every additional income created is devoted not for the basics, but for discretionary demand, which is why we're seeing what we're seeing on the right hand panel chart. So if GDP, which is <clears throat> which are or, or which consists of incomes created within our borders, payments to factors of production employed to produce this or that, um, and, so, and, and which has been rising over the past couple of years, certainly will contribute more to enhancing discretionary demand. But if that's gone now, then clearly um, it's this segment of consumption that will bear the burden of the adjustment. And then next slide is between construction and private capex. You can see here that uh, on the construction side, uh, even with just one month of ECQ, um, it's not even a full month uh, in March, uh, after the COVID-19 outbreak, um, <clears throat> construction activity across from residential, households, and non-profitable, non profit institutions to uh, private capex of uh, non-corporates, non-financial corporates to the banks are already uh, um, receding massively and uh, certainly entrenched in negative territory while infra spending has been admitted by government in its uh, first quarter budget report that uh, ECQ, logistical but issues and bottlenecks have uh, certainly are restrained um, deployment of the infra budget in the first quarter. And it's in real terms slight positive, but uh, nonetheless, um, it still failed to uh, um, deter construction from uh, registering a very negative number. Then prop capex right hand panel chart. You can see those red bars. Um, first quarter numbers all in negative territory except for road transport. Question is how long that will happen, but uh, it's a big chunk. But uh, if ever that gives way, all the more we're going to see a, a, a more um, a sadder picture as far as uh, investments are concerned. So um, <clears throat> if we see domestic demand uh, from consumption to investments easing off, big question there is that uh, when will it get reflected or will show up in uh, a, a, an accelerated uh, slowdown as far as inflation is concerned. And uh, uh, on that note, uh, take note that uh, please use the right term. It's disinflation. It's not yet deflation. Perhaps in Europe and Japan, that's what they'll experience, which is why uh, you know, negative interest rates have been adopted, embraced wholly by central banks in those parts of the world. No? But here, it's not yet at that you know, level. But uh, this inflation is accelerating, the way I see it, and will continue to accelerate. And uh, interesting to note that much of the inflation that we've seen in April, and we'll continue to see probably this quarter, is coming really from electricity, gas, and fuels, or energy-based and transport energy-based uh, components of CPI, and that its weighted impact, uh, given consumer preferences, is probably the largest uh, among the key segments, um, perhaps uh, very much in line with what we're seeing for rice, that's uh, creating uh, faster disinflation. And here, fish, fruits, and vegetables on an individual basis, posted two-digit gains for the month of March, yeah? Despite uh, wilting uh, demand, right? Begs the question of uh, why people are still buying food or these commodities despite higher prices. Just tells you that uh, there's money available, yeah? And uh, it's not as if uh, basic consumption is uh, dissipated or that there's mass starvation uh, in the islands, no. People are still willing to pay because they still have money. And uh, it also tells you that perhaps a little bit of government support can go a long way. 
So, you know, when you're seeing food prices, most of it, uh, key ones, still in, you know, um, posting, uh, registering uh, inflation uh, higher than headline. And there's where headline is, right? It just tells me that uh, basic consumption is still thriving and, you know, it could be borderline growth, but certainly not negative as what many are claiming it to be. All right. Um, having said that, and I, I know I'm running out of time and best to uh, uh, address some of the issues you want to discuss about the macroeconomy, let me just go into where the stress points, additional stress points would be and what the financial market implications are. You've seen the government's four pillars. I don't have to dwell on this. And pretty soon we will have Bayanian too. Uh, and I think uh, tomorrow, uh, government will start to uh, promote the, uh, uh, the need for additional stimulus that Congress will have to provide. Um, let me make me very clear about it. As I was telling, again, another batch of clients earlier, uh, the anti-COVID-19 playbook is already in place. Whether, and this is basically what it's going to do. They're going to tweak it, augment it, you know, inject more money into it. That's basically what the playbook would be. To not just save lives, uh, budget for the more health uh, and medical uh, capacities that can uh, uh, address uh, uh, COVID-19, huh? but at the same time, uh, protect the vulnerable households, those whose uh, fixed income wage earners, whose jobs are, are likely to be are very much threatened in this environment. And hopefully, you know, if government would be coordinating well with the local government officials, getting their act together and the uh, um, distributing a little bit more efficiently what they've done in March and April, um, perhaps uh, we will see a cyclical bottom that will um, lead to or be very close to a soft landing rather than a crash and burn scenario that um, um, some people are, uh, are promoting out there. And as far as uh, the comparison, taking Moody's analytics survey, um, as I say, uh, pointing out here that in the Philippines, it's not as huge as what you see in Thailand, even Vietnam, but I think uh, this can be expanded and will be expanded, considering the, uh, the focus that government is giving to some of these oriented fiscal, uh, uh, fiscal priorities as well as the second half uh, strategy on uh, um, uh, initiating and reviving uh, the BBB, uh, infrastructure policy, but uh, we'll have to see, but all told uh, and on balance, I would be expecting that the Philippine government would be um, undertaking a larger stimulus in the next uh, couple of quarters. So if that's the case, What's one stress point that the economy is going to feel other than, you know, consumption, discretionary spending, collapsing, import compression. The other side on the public set on the public segment would be a larger fiscal deficit is inevitable. Why? We will be seeing government uh, spending that's going to be focused, that's going to be, uh, shall we say, uh, headstrong, resolute in its uh, fiscal priorities and decoupling or likely to be decoupled from flat to lackluster to declining tax revenues. And if you see that happening, a very favorable anti-cyclical fiscal response to the headwinds uh, that we're facing due to the pandemic. And Already, the, um, and I think I've sent it to clients, the um, first quarter budget deficit uh, on a cash basis, especially for the month of March, 
made it made this uh, impression very evident. Um, government started to spend, uh, but not yet in line with the, uh, what we will see uh, or what we should be seeing as far as the stimulus package is concerned. While tax revenues, would you believe, slumped by 10.7 percent year on year, just for one month, right? for a month of March, and clearly because of uh, um, declining to very weak uh, business activity, import declines, import compression, customs and uh, uh, BIR uh, failed to collect as much as what they what the government would need. But nonetheless, government did spend. And the way I see it, um, that's going to be the attitude moving forward such that just to maintain a soft landing of 0 to 1%. If you look at the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5th column in this chart, in this slide, you need close more than 1 trillion pesos uh, in terms of uh, budget deficit, roughly 5 to 6% of GDP. In the latest, in what will come out, and I think it has already come out in some reports, government is already projecting 1.5 trillion deficit this year, uh, which is roughly going to correspond to about uh, 7 to 8% of GDP. Will they be able to sustain that? Uh, what's the impact on government debt? Well, it's uh, according to one estimate I saw, it's going to be to move the debt to GDP ratio from 41 to 50 percent of GDP it's not so bad compared to what you're seeing in other countries that have the same ratings as we do but uh, clearly the, the concern would be on whether uh, the economy can grow and recover quickly and secondly what would be the fiscal reforms that would have to be undertaken to make sure that over the medium to long term the republic, the sovereign's uh, debt paying capacity would not be compromised by the 2020 uh, fiscal stance. And if you see a one trillion or more deficit, the big question that government is going to borrow much of it onshore. The big question is, will this lead to a crowding out effect? as far as liquidity is concerned. And my sense is that no. BSP's balance sheet expansion already starting in March and the bazooka that it unveiled uh, not too long ago is certainly going to provide a system awash with liquidity. And most banks have the liquidity, but you know, in this environment, and working for a bank, uh, it just tells you that um, they're nurturing and protecting a limited capital and resources. And I know that it's terribly unfair um, <clears throat> to the borrowing public, so to speak, including most of their clients, but give it time. Um, hopefully all the stimulus and the balance sheet expansion uh, undertaken by uh, our central bank, uh, including the reserve cuts, policy rate now at a record low and could even be lower, less than 2%, uh, is certainly providing uh, much of the liquidity lubricating the system to make sure that um, we don't see a financial or credit crisis uh, moving forward. Uh, in the chart here, upper chart in this slide, you can see that red line shooting up to 80%. This is BSP buying uh, um, government securities in the secondary market, as well as repo facilities that they've established with the BSP. Um, because uh, when they do that, when they, just like the Fed and other global standards, when they buy assets, you know, they pay for it by printing money. That's it. That's all it means. <laughs> and uh, clearly, uh, since currencies are central bank's liability, the needless to say, that's going to expand their balance sheet on the liability side, uh, backed up by so-called assets earning assets, hopefully, that uh, um, they will be holding until, you know, the arrangement is uh, uh, reversed. Right now, what will this mean for interest rates? Well, uh, this slide gives you an idea of how low interest rates can be. 
given a combination of policy actions and scenarios. Already the 10-year BVAL rate is much lower than the lowest set of uh, estimates I have here of 3.56%. I think the BVAL today was established at 3.3% for the 10 years. But uh, clearly the, there's a lot more room or scope for the two-year, uh, the short duration rates to, uh, to flatten. Um, nonetheless, uh, as we, as the economy hits cyclical bottom, you'll probably see um, liquidity still crowding short duration, the yield curve still being uh, relatively flat, but as we proceed and move out of the dark place and uh, have our own recovery moving forward, um, the way I see it, you'll probably see the long end uh, starting to uh, uh, decompress and the uh, rates starting to move back up past three and a half percent uh, closer to four percent until the recovery brings about a uh, full GDP potential um, and that uh, it creates a lot of inflation which I doubt yeah um, that will prompt BSP to remove all this accommodation um, the game in town will still be fixed income securities. And then on to my last set of slides. Big question is uh, <clears throat> all that import compression as domestic demand narrows materially, uh, how will this impact our external accounts? And I have here scenarios on the import compression and how that will bring about a current account surplus regardless of OFW at risk or remittances at risk. Looking at the trade side, uh, if we take off from what happened 11 years ago, uh, getting some guidance from <clears throat> the data back then, um, clearly um, any import compression is, cer is certainly going to be in the uh, double digit variety, probably more than 20% um, for 2020. And clearly here, the, um, the concentration of the downturn will be in the second and the, the third quarter. As uh, imports of capital goods, uh, raw materials, uh, again, to mind everyone, would be narrowed materially, capex, postponed, um, construction probably, uh, uh, unlikely to be uh, back to its full potential, um, certainly going to contribute a lot to this import compression. And if the import compression is going to reduce the trade deficit, huh? the trade deficit, it's still going to be a deficit, but you know, it's going to be single digits. It brings about a current account surplus. Anywhere close from a four to 5% uh, on a worst case import basis to 2.7, maybe 3% uh, based on a two digit uh, import drop using um, our import equation that has some fundamentals like domestic demand as key determinants. So between the two, perhaps the truth or the reality would be somewhere in between, right? But point there is that whether it's a low to digit import compression to over 20% import compression and that shaping up right now. My thinking is that uh, a current account surplus is certainly likely. And that's for me is a very fundamental argument why the peso should prove 50, five zero, big thing. And uh, take note that these are numbers that I've had uh, since March um, when I looked at uh, and updated our balance of payments forecast. And what of the OFWs at risk? Here in this slide, it gives me some assumptions, the sensitivity test, uh, you know, nothing, uh, no AI here, but uh, focusing again on some key assumptions that can give us a sense, again, putting a structure to how bearish we can get 
as far as our forecasts are concerned. The government and DFA uh, has reported that over 200,000 OFWs have already asked for financial assistance from the different embassies, labor attaches, uh, where you'll find huge OFW communities. Yeah? Now, what if we assume that this is not just 230, it could double, or it could even reach 1 million, which is 10% of the total Filipino contractual and migrant workers out there, including the nurses and, uh, you know, those in the medical profession, IT professionals, bankers, those occupying uh, <coughs> senior administrative positions, etc. Now, in my worst case scenario, I'm here assuming that this one million, yeah, you, you could even do your own set of uh, assumptions saying it's 1.5 uh, or maybe even two, um, would probably be populated to a large extent by the blue collar workers, service providers, those in the hotels, uh, truck drivers, you know, uh, manufacturing workers, construction workers, especially the undocumented ones. They will be the ones so vulnerable. They, those that send 200 to $300 per month their families here in the Philippines. Those are the first ones that could probably get cut, laid off, furloughed in this environment. And if we assume $300 per month of 1 million workers, OFWs, having no jobs for nine months, starting April, last April up to the end of December, you know how much we lose? You know, spreadsheet. Calculations will show $2.7 billion, or roughly 10% of the OFW remittances. And how will that affect our forecast on the current account side? In the same high case scenario, look at the number. It's only going to pare down the current account surplus from, or our estimate of the highest surplus of 4.6% to just barely 4%. So the downside risk, in my view, the remittance test would probably have a larger impact on consumption rather than the current account. And if that's the case, and considering the, oops, sorry. Um, If that's the case, and considering the, um, uh, the surplus condition, uh, still likely to be persistent even with downside risk to uh, OFWs and the remittance flows, what's my estimate of the peso dollar? 50 and maybe even less um, based on our uh, exchange rate quarterly regression that takes into account the import cover and uh, uh, the current account gap as key determinants. Yeah? And certainly uh, on a fundamental basis, uh, just on a fundamental note, I don't see a reason why the peso cannot appreciate in this pandemic, considering that corporate FX demand is practically non existent low oil prices are going to contribute to the surplus. And basically, uh, the economy is down and out. Will mar spook markets buy uh, the surplus dollars, perhaps, and save them in your FCDU? But for most of the traders that I know, that I've spoken to, you know, um, how will they earn money if they buy all these dollars, go long dollars, when they know that the recovery is going to take some time. So they'll probably, especially the remittance banks, sell it down gradually, unless the central bank, and that's, this is a caveat, starts to buy all these dollars, but uh, to aid the remittance uh, recipients. But the way I see it, BSP is primarily focused on uh, especially their balance sheets to uh, 
um, <clears throat> maintaining, at least uh, ensuring that uh, the economy goes through a soft landing and from their perspective, clearly um, sustaining whatever credit flows that we've seen in the not too distant past would be, be very crucial from the BSP's mandate uh, to lubricate uh, whatever economic activity is left. And as such, um, I don't see them being actively involved in intervening in the market, which is very evident. And that uh, as Governor Jokno keeps on saying, when you talk to and questioned about exchange rate policy here, then and now, he keeps on saying that uh, you know, they prefer a more market-driven type of economy. So from 50, 70, 50, 80, when we had this forecast, it's now down to hit a low of uh, less than 50, 30. Um, just bounced back right now because of a little bit of strong dollar or risk off, but the weight of liquidity will, in my view, drive you know, uh, um, the dollar peso to where the fundamentals are, and the fundamentals are not looking that bright, and so appreciation is certainly in the offing. So one trading business strategy that I'm telling clients is that uh, hedge your FX sales, particularly for dollar earners, um, at least in the near term, while for importers, if you're still importing, um, keep your positions open. All right, so um, I think I've uh, said a lot um, and certainly will want to entertain questions moving forward, but just to uh, provide a little bit of summary to all this, um, there's a lot to talk about, I know. Number one is that uh, um, we're now in the midst of uh, um, um, the search for the cyclical bottom, not there yet, but certainly getting there and uh, do track the hard data. Um, and if you're a client of ours, I will certainly uh, provide you with all the updates that you need and give you the two, two cents worth uh, uh, that can be used for business planning moving forward. And as I've said, that cyclical bottom tells you the minimum, minimum of spending by households and businesses huh? um, this quarter and what they and if can and then the, uh, it, it can get extended I know but uh, at least for the second quarter to tell you that uh, um, it's not going to get any worse hopefully um, and uh, prompting us to think about what the recovery would look like moving forward second point to highlight is that uh, you know, uh, structure, please put a structure to your sober or bearish sentiment on this economy or the other markets that you're looking into. Because if you look at the data, it will be very clear to you where the choke points will be. In my view, given the market now, given the economy we have now, as I've said, it's more diversified and larger than what it was in previous crises. Yeah? So discretionary demand is going to take the brunt of the adjustment. If you're in that business, better brace yourself for the worst. If not, uh, clearly, uh, uh, you have to rethink your business models moving forward. Um, secondly, when we see investments, uh, consumption um, uh, compressed uh, very significantly, that will translate into a lot of import compression and paving the way for my argument of a current account surplus that certainly would put pressure on a fundamental note on the dollar peso. And government will be the key catalyst to spending. There will be a bayanihan too pretty soon. Uh, thinking of uh, um, just how much uh, and, uh, to spend, to inject more money, focusing on the needy and the vulnerable ones, uh, coupled with some tweaking on um, preparing for the groundwork for the recovery, huh? but all this would cost money. And government can spend, can prioritize, you know, can come up with the most ambitious or grandiose plans, not just here, but in the U.S. and everywhere. And the question there is that uh, if you cannot collect, 
the money you need, then obviously you'll have a swelling budget deficit. That's not going to create a lot of illiquidity problems. It's just convincing the banks now to be a little bit less stingy. And perhaps it's more of a BSP role. But the way I see it, uh, until we get out of this dark and gloomy place, we'll probably see a liquidity crowding the fixed income markets and uh, um, leading to rates that are at thresholds that we've never seen before. This has certainly helped the recovery, but the way I see it, what's crucial, and I go back to the demand situation, what's crucial will be how confident businesses and the consumer, especially the households, would be in spending um, that's going to determine you know, um, whether the recovery will be more meaningful than uh, um, what others are saying. Let me stop here uh, and maybe uh, open this webinar to Q&A. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Sir Juan. Um, I think we have time for about one or two questions. So I'm going to go ahead and read out a few that were sent to us during, during registration. So we actually received over 50 questions, but we've summed up some common points given okay. who was who, which, which companies were uh, registering to the webinar. So one commonly asked question was, which sec sectors do you think will recover first and which will hurt the most? So how do you see the performance of industries such as real estate, BPOs, and yeah. automotive for the rest of the year? Yeah, excellent question. Um, <clears throat> um, well, the thing is, uh, in any recovery, and this is, you know, this is very evident, in past uh, downturns that we've seen here and anywhere else, you have to identify sectors that we lead, sectors that we be that we lag, yeah, and those that will be somewhere in the middle, uh, probably in limbo, so to speak. Huh? Well, those that will, and it's, not, it's again a no-brainer. Those that will lead are those that have been identified by this administration as essentials. Now. <clears throat> I know that uh, that's a very haphazard type of identification, uh, given the lockdown um, and the uh, you know the uh, the haste by which the ECQ was put in place. But these are basically your consumer type of industries, especially the food side, including food manufacturing and perhaps packaging. Now, the telcos, health and uh, social welfare, uh, financials. And the BPOs, uh, in my view, these are the key industries that will probably lead uh, the recovery. They will be given, uh, you know, uh, kid gloves treatment by the government, and certainly government will be very open to them uh, to any suggestions on how to um, fast track uh, spending and uh, normalizing their operations while. Travel, tourism-related industries, and other quote-unquote non-essentials like those that you'll find in the other services would probably lag the recovery. Now, in between um, <clears throat> would be utilities, the way I see it, construction, which is starting now, and they've uh, you know, allowed only the essential, again, priority projects, suppose these are the big ones, the PPPs, to, to uh, uh, proceed. Uh, real estate to a certain extent and the wholesale trade business uh, would be those that are neither here nor there, but certainly uh, uh, would be given due consideration uh, if let's say the lockdown were to be, uh, 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 shall we say, lifted in full. Um, again, needless to say, whether in, you're in the first category or the last category, my heart goes out for the SM, MSMEs because, you know, these are the companies that do not have the balance sheet flexibility to adjust to this new environment. 
and probably be most at risk and will certainly contribute to the burgeoning NPL risk that banks would feel, particularly if these economies would only be operating at below 50% capacity. So uh, the, that's the general rule I have. I mean, again, I'm talking macro here. But uh, even if, let's say, for firms that are allowed to operate, the big question is how do you retain your productivity of the employees? And clearly, um, to convince the employees to come back to work and uh, you know, work alongside the virus, so to speak, because that virus is not going to go away until the vaccine is discovered and you don't know when. And we're not even sure whether consumers like you and me, uh, maybe with the exception of Chris Nelson, would be able to afford that vaccine. Yeah? And so the thing is, uh, the welfare of the employee should be first and foremost. Business and health protocol in all these companies, big ones and small ones, should be there, including who will shoulder the cost of uh, an employee uh, getting sick, um, you know, uh, when they return to work, uh, um, has to be addressed to make sure that uh, most of these employees uh, returning back to work um, would be as productive as they were before COVID. At the same time, um, Companies, just like PNB, will have to determine who are at risk and who may not be at risk. Uh, and that's why the work from home capability is still there and will continue to be there. And some companies will probably have to focus more on, you know, uh, getting their work from home capabilities a lot more effective uh, moving forward. So we put them all together. What's crucial for companies that are in my view, uh, that we'd be allowed to operate, whether fully or, you know, uh, partially would be how do you uh, maximize and retain the productivity of your workforce um, when things start, when the lockdown is gradually lifted, uh, particularly in Metro Manila, and that uh, the recovery is upon us. Now, for specific sectors, uh, Again, I'm talking macro here. Um, uh, according to Adi, uh, most of you are in the real estate sector. Well, let's put it this way. Uh, here's where I, I, I break down the sector and saying that uh, uh, if the consumer priorities will change massively the way I see it, and one driver of that would be key questions like, is my job safe? You know, uh, is the business that I have, will it still thrive in this, uh, uh, in this pandemic? Then my thinking is that what can be postponed will definitely be postponed. And new residential demand would probably be, uh, or residential demand for new homes would probably be difficult to uh, promote in this environment in a um, situation in which the average consumer would, of course, middle class and up, would still be very wary of, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, um, deploying resources, deploying their household balance sheets to non-essential items. It, and, and this would probably include even those uh, investing in real estate, buying new condos, houses, resorts for Airbnb, etc. Since prospects for travel, tourism, and other service businesses would probably be muted at this juncture. Not even again, the prospects are so, uh, shall we say, blurry uh, moving forward. And perhaps uh, the need for social distancing protocols and uh, uh, additional space if some companies would uh, um, feel the need for it, uh, even if let's say 30 or 40% of their workforce would be work from home, particularly seniors like me. You know, I mean, uh, then why do you still need additional space? But for those companies, 
that would still need additional space, then perhaps this is where the malls, existing commercial establishments, um, would have to innovate and uh, perhaps uh, um, offer some uh, brilliant suggestions, uh, ways of doing things that can accommodate this additional demand. So the way I see it, um, again, boils down to what I was saying earlier, prioritization of where the demand is, what can be postponed, what can be delayed uh, at a time when uh, job security, income opportunities are at risk, will certainly drive uh, much of the prospects for any segment of the industry moving forward. Okay, great. Thank you for that, sir. Um, and perhaps before we move on to closing, just one more for most of our viewers who are actually um, based in the UK. So we also received a couple of questions relating yep. to the relationship between the UK and Philippines post COVID-19. So moving forward, what export opportunities do you see between um, the UK and the Philippines could take place? Um, oh, that's a tough one since uh, <clears throat> just looking at certain macro numbers and uh, I'm not sure it's a very clear guide to what the you know uh, potential trade outlook would be. Uh, in the past, uh, we know that uh, UK is certainly one of the key trading partners in Europe and still hosting a large OFW segment. Um, <clears throat> hopefully that will remain intact, but uh, uh, clearly uh, there will be some adjustments as, as you and I know. But speaking of what the potentials are, well, let's put it this way. For the Philippines, um, <clears throat> uh, one very glaring need I see in this pandemic, and as I've said, it won't go away very quickly, would be the necessary and essential medical and health tools, facilities, and even services that we all know when the pandemic broke was sorely lacking from basic testing kits to what PPEs. Um, now I'm hearing, uh, you know, ventilators, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> that's not available, that's in short supply. Um, they're making do with the secondhand equipment. So sense I'm getting is that uh, if our trading partners would like to take exploit so to speak, the situation that we're in right now. Um, <clears throat> exporting um, and providing these types of services to the government hospitals, private hospitals, um, medical clinics, and even companies, huh? companies, manufacturing concerns that need to establish testing sites, uh, and perhaps even quarantine facilities in their plants, in their facilities. At least encourage uh, workers to go and, uh, you know, instead of going back home to spend, you know, uh, a week there and uh, plan on the, you know, uh, the number of skeletal force. Uh, all this would be certainly well appreciated and in my view, would be very much in demand uh, moving forward in this environment. And I know the United Kingdom, Europe, um, you know, given their experience and the uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the medical and health uh, industry advances and capabilities, uh, if they have surplus capacities as far as uh, these types of uh, um, commodities, equipment are concerned, it's certainly going to be very much appreciated. Uh, and most especially if they're going to come in, uh, not as expensive, huh? as, uh, and can be and be made affordable, uh, commercially available um, to most uh, health practitioners in this country. The second one, I think, um, would be of uh, use would be as we've seen uh, on the not just on the Wi-Fi space, but uh, the fintechs applications that can certainly uh, address some of the vulnerabilities, not just in terms of communications, but retail, payment abilities uh, of some companies, especially 
those that were ill prepared when this pandemic struck. But uh, it's always a face to face type of situation, payment situation, selling situation. Now, <clears throat> you know, companies will have to uh, rethink their marketing and, and uh, payment strategy because, you know, uh, you, you'll see most of your consumers after they do their basic uh, uh, grocery stuff, stockpiling, go back home. So how do you um, <clears throat> provide, cater to these uh, um, consumers that are scared, that are worried? Well, at the same time, they still have the money to be able to um, engage in the same set of business transactions, service transactions that uh, we've known in the past. So the way I say it, uh, you know, if UK can uh, provide, uh, you know, this fintech type of applications, export them here, uh, talk with some of the private companies and even the MSMEs that do not have this, uh, you know, online capability. That certainly will be, again, very much in demand. Hopefully, uh, if these uh, tech services are, <laughs> are, are affordable <laughs> and commercially available, I think that that will certainly go a long way, not just in strengthening trade ties, but at the same time, um, you know, addressing some of the immediate problems that we face. Right. Thank you, sir. Um, I agree. And fintech and health infrastructure are definitely some knowledge um, that UK could provide to the Philippines <laughs> oh, just moving forward. So before we end, um, our executive director, Chris Nelson, is here to give a few closing remarks. Hey, June, are you listening? Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm still here, Chris. Hi. So first of all, thanks very much to June Trinidad of the Philippine National Bank, uh, a very good friend of mine and good economist for giving his overview. Uh, apologies, I couldn't join at the very beginning because we were running another webinar. And I think that's of relevance to people listening because that was with Secretary Lopez of the Department of Trade and Investment. And I'd like to just highlight a couple of points, if I may, because I think it links very well with June's presentation. And that is uh, a specific question is, when will Metro Manila or the Northern Capital Region, National Capital Region or Luzon move from the current uh, or as of modified uh, enhanced uh, community quarantine to the general? And the anticipation, or it's not a commitment, is that'll be the 1st of June. So I. I wanted to raise that because I think that also affects planning. The other point I wanted to raise, which I think is very critical, is what I call managing risk. And I think June said that no one knows when the vaccine will be available, although he did say I was the only one who could probably afford it. Not sure about that, June. Uh, but I think we have to assume that we will be living with this <clears throat> and therefore managing it. And I think that requires how we go about our business, right? Uh, and the other thing I just say in all of this is that um, I think it's great to get an overview. I think we all have a role to play, uh, either as a company or as an individual, that when we are able to go out or do things in our own small way, we have to start the economy. And it starts from kind of everybody doing that. So I think the points brought out were extremely good. Uh, I think I'd like to thank June for his uh, incisiveness. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, June, it's, it's a situation, <clears throat> excuse me, that you would constantly be looking at like all economists because naturally situations will change and there may be developments that we have not anticipated, correct? Yeah. Sure thing, Chris. And, but I think, fine, I'd like to say thanks to people who've dialed in from the UK as well as the Philippines. Uh, we at the British Chamber 
are obviously challenged like everybody, but our determination to grow trade and investment between the two countries is not challenged or diminished. In fact, far from it, we're looking now how we can actually grow it. And I would just welcome all of you to keep on dialing in. And we are determined, notwithstanding the changes that everyone has to make, is we will grow the business between the two countries. So first of all, a warm thanks again to June. That was exceptionally good. And thanks for everybody for dialing in. AD, I think that's the end, correct? Yes. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.